understand this. From the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes, there will be seven sevens. With this video, I'm just going to reveal a whole lot of information which uh, points to the year 2015-2016. Well, all the, the, the Sanhedrin... Uh, rabbis all confirm that the year Hebrew year 5776 which is this year is the jubilee year it ends October 2nd to October 12th give or take again don't worry about days it ends October of this year it started September of last year ends October of this year is the fifth is the is the 50th year okay once again very interesting 67 1967 but it's the it's the 50th year it is what some people would call the final jubilee okay so this seventh shmita that is coming up could be could be the wrap up not just for america but everything and it could be prophetic but for certain at this moment we are all now living in this window called the end of time it's got june right 7th 1967 Add that here, the result is September 23rd, 2015. Now, this date, if you're already aware, maybe you're not, this is the Day of Atonement. And the White House announcing that the President and the First Lady will host Pope Francis on September 23rd during his first ever papal visit to the United States. Do not tell my people that I am coming soon. Tell my people that I am coming right away. I then saw people running from one place to another, shouting, Christ came. I suddenly heard the loud trumpet sound from the sky. Rise up here. There positively is a group of people on the face of the earth who control the world. Nothing ever happens in Washington by chance. Nothing takes place in the financial world by happen so. Men behind closed doors have decided everything that's going to happen, and my lifestyle and yours oftentimes is controlled by these people by what they do. And what is the Federal Reserve? It's not even an agency of the government of the United States of America. It is a private corporation that has literally taken over our currency in this country. Adam Clark was an advocate for the idea that people could know the dates and time periods involving prophecy. However, he believed that one could not know these dates using the Roman calendar. Instead, he believed that you must use the Hebrew calendar. Clark estimated that if one uses the Hebrew calendar, then you could arrive at 2015 as the beginning of Roman Catholicism's downfall. A ninth man who predicted that 2016 is a very significant year is William McRae, who wrote The Character and Prospects of the Church of Rome. He believes that the great whore Babylon would experience the wrath of God for having opposed the Lord. This would occur in 2016. He also says that a great jubilee would happen to the church. This is a time period when believers would be protected from harm for 1,000 years. Interestingly, many Bible scholars acknowledge that we entered a Jubilee year starting on September 23, 2015. A tenth prediction was made by Robert Clayton, a renowned preacher and scholar in the mid-18th century. He was also a contemporary of Isaac Newton. Clayton made specific predictions that, beginning in 2015, the world would see the following events. The end of the Jewish diaspora, the fall of the papacy, the coming of the Messiah, and the restoration of the Jews. He also believed that this time period would conclude a 2,000-year window of the church. Clayton did not come to this conclusion using the Julian calendar. He created his timeline based on the Hebrew calendar, as he was a scholar of rabbinical literature. An 11th prediction came from a man by the name of John Brown, who penned a dictionary of the whole Bible. In a discussion about prophecy, he suggests that all Jews will undergo a mass conversion accepting Jesus starting in 2016. He also states that a force, including Turkey and its allies, will come against Israel in 2016, but this force will be completely destroyed. 
The twelfth prediction is by a man named Philip Doddridge, who cites that Sir Isaac Newton appeared to be pointing to 2016 as a year of prophetic fulfillment. Like many scholars of his time, he believed that 1260 days of revelation should be interpreted as 1260 years. He also references 666 years after the writing of the book of Revelation, which brings us to 756 AD, the year in which the papacy became a temporal power. He believed that an antichrist system would be fully ushered in in 2016. I did not cover Isaac Newton's theology in this video, but what he said seemed to influence all the other Bible scholars that I discussed. Isaac Newton was first and foremost a theologian, not a scientist as many people assume. In fact, it was estimated that Newton dedicated only 10% of his time to science. The other 90% was dedicated to studying the scriptures, particularly the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation and the fulfillment and building of the temple. Isaac Newton was wildly interested in the temple for some reason, and he also pointed to this time period, the end of 2015 through 2016. We will see over the coming several months whether the predictions of these men turn out to be true. It is interesting to consider that all of them arrived at a single year, and we are in the middle of it. You can go all the way back to Genesis, and God said that, uh, I will not always strive with man, but man's years will be 120 years. Now, people have taken that to think, okay, a man's lifespan can only be 120 years. But if you take 120 jubilees, and do the math on that. Um, a jubilee is 49 years, and then the 50th year is um, the jubilee year. So 50 times 120. That's 6,000 years. So 120 jubilees is exactly the 6,000 year time frame. And then we have the thousand year millennium, you know, and that matches the creation week because Peter said, uh, Peter said a day shall be as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day to the Lord. I've been studying Isaac Newton and what a lot of people don't know about Isaac Newton was he wasn't just a dude about science. Um, he spent a lot of his life studying the book of Daniel. He was actually a Bible scholar. Um, if I remember right, he knew Greek, Hebrew, or at least he knew Hebrew, and um, he studied Daniel's ninth chapter, the, the chapter that contains the 70 weeks. Um, people have done the science on it and said that uh, another heavenly body came by Earth and it altered the orbit and slowed it down by a couple days and stuff, so the the annual calendar used to be 360 days. Now it's more like 365 and a quarter. But um, the original count, the original way to do a Jewish calendar is 360 days. And that's confirmed by, you know, multiple numbers in the Bible um, where it says that the apocalypse would be a time, times, and half a time. You know, that's three and a half years. Uh, 42 months and 1260 days. So those numbers are all three different ways of saying the same thing. The point is that when you calculate these years, it should be done on a 360 day Jewish calendar. So here's what I want to show you. Um, Isaac Newton, when he trans, uh, when he translated this verse, he said, "Know also and understand." that from the going forth of the commandment to cause to return and build Jerusalem unto the uh, anointed, the prince shall be seven weeks. And he made a case that the first coming and the second coming were revealed in this prophecy. The Hebrew here, where it says, you know, in the King James, it says something like to cause to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, right? 
But if you go back in the Hebrew, it talks about to return. It talks about the return. So during the Six-Day War in 1967, it was the first time that the Jews came back to the Western Wall and captured the holy city of Jerusalem and brought it into um, ownership of the Jews since 70 AD. So when you read this and it says the commandment to cause to return, or, you know, it's the time that they were returned to Jerusalem, the date that they were returned to Jerusalem was June 7th, 1967. Now, you go back and you do that according to the 360-day um, year, 49 years. I've got my little calculator here, right? So, according to the prophecy, you have seven weeks. Now, these are weeks of years, so that makes it 49 years. You follow? Now, when you take that on a Jewish year, that's times 360 days, as opposed to our 365-day year that we use. And this is the number of days that this prophecy, I believe, reveals. So you have, you've got 17,640 days, okay? Now, this is uh, timeanddate.com. It's a date calculator. And we've got June, right, 7th, 1967, okay? Now, that number that I just gave you, the 17,640, again, that's a 360-day year times 49 years, which is seven weeks of years. You add that here to days, calculate new date, okay? The result, September 23rd, 2015. Now, this date, if you're already aware, maybe you're not, this is the Day of Atonement um, this coming year. Now, there's many other prophetic events happening this fall. Um, if you've heard of Jonathan Kahn, I suggest you study up on what he has presented. But the Shemitah year, which is a seven-year cycle, that ends on September 13th, which is, um, it has a pattern of major financial collapses, major financial resets. Um, in the past, there have been it's called the Lul 29. It's the last day of the Shemitah year prior to Rosh Hashanah. And many times it has coincided with financial collapse. And there's been ones that have had solar eclipses. And those have been some of the biggest collapses on record in American history. So that date is on September 13th. That is a solar eclipse. The, the, the final lunar eclipse of the four... Uh, lunar Eclipse Tetrad is on September 30th. Now, there's a time between the Rosh Hashanah date and the Day of Atonement, and that's 10 days. I forget if that's the 10 days of all or not, but Day of Atonement is the first day of the Jubilee. And the Jubilee is associated with uh, letting slaves go free, restoring lands, forgiving debts, um, in many things. The uh, the Shemitah year is often linked with um, similar things, but also with judgment. If someone has fallen away from God, 9-11 uh, was on the end of a Shemitah year. The uh, 2008 stock collapse was on the end of a Shemitah year. That was a 777-point fall in a single day. This is what we're looking at. We're looking at this pattern because a seven-year Shemitah cycle ends on September 13th. Um, and the last two Shemitah cycles were uh, judgment. They were 9-11 and they were the uh, financial collapse. And then the next cycle is the Jubilee year cycle. The last two Jubilees were 1967 when Israel captured Jerusalem. The one prior to that was... Um, 1917, the Balfour Declaration, when um, Allenby, General Allenby of Great Britain, came into Jerusalem and captured Jerusalem. 
uh, the Balfour Declaration was also a declaration saying that Palestine would become the home of the Jewish people, but it still took, uh, you know, another couple of decades to actually bring that to pass. You know, Israel becoming a nation in uh, in a single day, which is, I'm cheating, um, is Isaiah 66, 8. Thanks, MP. Thanks, bro. Yeah, bro. You know, Israel became a nation in a day, and, um, you know, that was May 14th, 1948. The last two blood moon cycles were right after Israel became a nation and right after Israel captured Jerusalem. So this next lunar cycle, we have these three cycles. We have, the, like I said, the Shemitah, we have the Jubilee, and now we have the blood moon. And then I believe Isaac Newton confirms these things with the very same numbers because what are the odds that you get a perfect day count on a Jewish calendar that from the capture of Jerusalem to Day of Atonement this year, it's dead on to the very day. When that big, that peak day comes, a little 29, it's going to be a solar eclipse on marking that day. The great day of nullification the, at the end of the Shemitah is going to be a solar eclipse the same day. You have been studying this, but not just studying as a scholar, which you are, but by revelation. I want you to tell me what you think is going to happen. I believe, whether it happens in this period or not, and I'd be ready, I believe, without any question, a great shaking is coming to America. And this shaking will affect the economy, will affect the financial realm, will, uh, and can be very well more than either of those realms, but it will affect that. Something like a famine in the land. I believe uh, even services and infrastructure will, will stop. Will be, so I believe a great warning, and it's in God's mercy. Because at this point, without shaking, I don't believe there can be revival. God's heart is revival. But we have to be ready. Anything that can be shaken will be shaken. Okay, we only have two minutes left. Uh, what is this uh, seventh, uh, Shemitah? seventh Shemitah or slash? <laughs> okay, Jubilee? okay. There's so much, and and there's so many. So I'll just just touch on this. Okay, when you get to the seventh Shemitah, you get you, that's that's seven times seven years, forty nine years. It leads to the Jubilee. So right. even the Jubilee is linked to the mystery of the Shemitah. Jubilee is about restoring, getting back your land, getting back your home. You're restored to your inheritance. Well, two thousand years ago. Israel lost its inheritance, lost the land. Well, what happened is, remember that the Jubilee only comp starts at the year after a Shemitah. Well, the restoration of Israel begins 1917 with a Balfour Declaration when they give the land back to Israel, Britain. 1917 follows the year of the Shemitah. It's the, it's the next thing. It's like Jubilee. It's restoration of the land. If you go seven Shemitahs later from 1917, it brings you to 1967, the restoration of Jerusalem, right after the year of the Shemitah. So I mean, precise. It, it is so, the restoration and the next one is coming. The, the next, if you go seven more Shemitahs, it comes to two. The next Shemitah is 2015. The year after is 2016. I'm not saying God has to, but it's amazing what he's done. He's just amazing. He's in charge of everything. So this seventh Shemitah that is coming up could be, could be the wrap up, not just for America, but everything. Could, in be, could be prophetic. And, and again, we can't put God in a box, but isn't it amazing? The Shemitah holds the mystery really of everything. But the mystery of everything has to be simple. <laughs> yes. It's in Yeshua, Jesus, yes. the Jewish Messiah. Yes. Repent of your sins. Ask Jesus to be your Lord, live inside of you, start reading the Bible, and I'm telling you, if you walk in the same peace that I'll train you and equip you to walk in that God's given me, nothing will bother you, nothing. People like Hosea Guelas and some of who are Mayan, but to be very clear, the National Mayan Council of Elders of Guatemala, according to Don Alejandro, has not said one word in 527 years. That's a very long time of silence. So you can see why the Maya breaking their silence at this time should be of great importance to the world. And further, everything that we now know about the Maya has to be put aside so we can hear the truth, not a truth made up by outsiders who are simply guessing or are living a consciousness that has almost nothing to do with the Maya. Here's what Don Alejandro told me about the Mayan prophecy of 2012. First of all, he said there is a window of time around this date, December 21st, 2012, the Mayan call the end of time. 
It is about seven or eight years in dur duration. This window began, as I understand it, on October 24, 2007, but I have not been told the exact date it would end. But for certain, at this moment, we are all now living in this window called the end of time. Don Alejandro also said that the likelihood that the Mayan prophecy would begin on that date of December 21st, 2012, as most people in the world believe, is extremely unlikely. He simply said it would begin somewhere in the window at the end of time, which means any minute from now and could late begin as late as 2015. This is something that none of the uh, prophecies that this is something that none of the uh, prophecies that the modern world is talking about is uh, is saying. Yes, that date is precise. Uh, the December 21st is exactly when the cycles line up and all these things happen. Uh, that can be seen even from the NASA uh, understanding of all of these of the calendars and the, and everything. Uh, again, it's not just the indigenous people, it's science also can see that this is a very incredibly precise moment in time. But uh, uh, the Mayans, again, I'll reiterate, re reiterate they are saying that, this, uh, uh, that it is not, even though the cycles end exactly at that time, and the Yi Ching does uh, come to zero except at that time, uh, that uh, the actual change in consciousness and the movement of events uh, that begin with the magnetic poles and the, and the, and the physical poles shifting, uh, it, is the, it, it is the consciousness change that occurs directly after that or during that possibly, uh, that this is what is important. Uh, and, and exactly how that happens, uh, I don't know. And neither do the Mayans, evidently. Don Alejandro, Don Alejandro was very clear about this. Uh, he said that uh, they cannot predict at this point uh, the precise moment uh, when this uh, huge uh, uh, change will occur, but that it is more than likely not going to occur on December 21st, 2012. It'll happen sometime in the window between 2007 and 2015, somewhere in there uh, is when this will occur. So it may come 2000, uh, 20, December 21st, 2012, nothing happens because it might happen afterwards, according to the Maya. It could happen as late as three years afterwards. Uh, but they are convinced, the White are convinced, uh, the aboriginals in Australia, uh, the Zulu in Africa, uh, the Hopi and tribes all over the world that I'm familiar with, they are all convinced that this is going to happen. We are, have reached the end of this cycle, and we are going to move up into a new level of consciousness. This is a great thing. Uh, we should be celebrating. Pope Francis, he's coming to Washington. While he's there, he'll pay a visit to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. The Pope is coming to America, but specifically visiting Washington. The White House announcing that the President and the First Lady will host Pope Francis on September 23rd. The odds that you get a perfect day count on a Jewish calendar that from the capture of Jerusalem to Day of Atonement this year, it's dead on to the very day. Um, you know, Scripture says, I think it's Joel to something where it says the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon turned to blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord. There's many scriptures that say, um, you brethren are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. That's uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, 4. There's many other verses where it says to watch. Um, what is it? Luke 21, 36. Uh, Watch and pray that you be accounted worthy to escape these things which are coming upon the earth and stand before the Son of Man. In 1938, a South American prophet named Benjamin Baravicini drew this picture and wrote, The Pope will go on journeys far from the Vatican, and will arrive to America. Meanwhile the humanity will fall down.
professor for the Pope's uh, uh, University in Rome. And uh, uh, he is a very highly respected intellectual. Uh, his last name is Tanzniti. And he has written a paper now in which he is saying that very soon, not, a, not right in the beginning, we won't have to um, deny our Christian faith in the beginning. But there is information coming from another world, and once it is confirmed, it is going to require a rereading of the gospel as we know it. And that's the kind of information that we are receiving from the highest levels of Vatican intelligentsia. Where's this headed, in your opinion, after all this research? I think it's headed towards an imminent great deception. I learned many things about the elite. And one of the first things I learned was to listen to their buzzwords. Probably the next most important thing, and by the way, let me pause here long enough to say, any movie that comes out of Hollywood, uh, any uh, uh, liberal news media, any program that I might watch on any given afternoon, I can pick out buzzwords. I have tuned my mind and my ear over 35 years uh, to listening to what these people have to say. And things that the average person would probably never pick up on, immediately they stand out in my mind. The elite, the second thing I learned, most important thing about the elite, they have a code of ethics. <laughs> now I know this sounds strange, and especially when it's coming from a man who's been a minister of the gospel for 55 years, but the elite do have a code of ethics. Now, their code of ethics is quite different than your code of ethics and my code of ethics. My code of ethics is the Word of God, the Bible. My Savior is Jesus Christ. And everything that I do in life revolves around obedience to the Word of God, if at all possible. And I have to overcome the flesh, as everyone else does, in order to do that. But the elite have a code of ethics also. Their code of ethics, one of the facets of their code of ethics is they must tell you everything they're going to do before they do it. You heard me correctly. They will tell you through a Hollywood movie. They will tell you through buzzwords. They will tell you through expressions that you may hear on the national media. But if you know how to tune your ear to listen to what the elite are saying, you will know everything that's going to take place tomorrow, a week from now, a month from now, a year from now, if you know how to listen to what they're telling you. The elite have taken away your God. Yes, you heard me correctly. They had to. You've heard me tell this before on radio shows and in other DVD presentations I've made. But they have a plan to remove the God who made America great. And the only way that they could bring in their new world order was to remove the God that had made America great from our society. They took the Ten Commandments off of the courthouse steps. They removed the Bible from the classroom. They had to remove righteousness and God from our society before they could bring in their new world order. We have 500 days to avoid a climate chaos. There will be climate chaos in the next, coming up within 500 days, which takes us to September 24th, 2015. Was he, what's he talking about? Uh, the Pope is scheduled to make his first papal visit to the United States this fall, and it promises to be historic. And it promises to be historic. On September 24th, uh, His Holiness, Pope Francis, uh, will visit us here at the United States Capitol. Uh, that day, uh, His Holiness will be the first Pope in our history to address a joint session of Congress. Uh, we're humbled that the Holy Father has accepted our invitation, and certainly look forward to receiving his message on behalf of the American people. We're going to look forward to receiving his message on behalf 
of the American people. Today we learned the papal visit has been designated a national special security event, meaning that Secret Service, Homeland Security, and the FBI will all be playing a role. Now listen to what Tom Horn had to say about the reason for the Pope coming to meet with the President in September. In 2009, what happens? All of a sudden the Vatican starts doing something the Vatican's never done before. They call for an astrobiology study week. They have the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, which, by the way, Francis just met with in secret this week. Is that a prelude to something that's coming up in either this or the next encyclical? Well, he's meeting with them. But those scientists for the Vatican, they came together. They brought together the most powerful astronomers in the world, geologists, theoretical physicists like work at CERN. But they also brought in theologians. And that whole week, they started discussing what they've never stopped discussing since, and that is what would the impact on faith be, on religion be, given the disclosure or the discovery of advanced extraterrestrial intelligence in the universe. If we suddenly do what Steve Quayle has just asked, and tomorrow morning we wake up and all of a sudden it's, all, it's on every major news station, here's the President of the United States of America, here's the President of Europe, and China, and they're standing there, and right in front of them is Petrus Romanus, the final pope on the 800-year-old prophecy of the Catholics, and he is saying, we have an announcement to make. We are in contact with extraterrestrial intelligence, or we have an announcement to make, they're here. Why would they need to disclose to us about aliens unless the rapture had just happened or was imminent as part of the plan to cover up the rapture event and make it seem like an alien intervention of our planet to save humanity from extinction? They know what's coming in September. When John Paul says we're going to release the third secret and it describes the bishop in white. A bishop in white, he's walking through a city that is, uh, sounds like it's been bombed or, or it's been hit by a meteorite or something has happened mm -hmm. because the city is just in ruins, yeah, half in ruins. Corpses everywhere. And, corpses yeah, everywhere, yeah. people dying everywhere. He's walking along praying for the people as they're dying and he's trying to make his way to a cross. And at that time, ISIS-like fighters run into the city and they shoot him, right? And they kill him. I'm going to show you a picture released by the Vatican. Before I do, look at the number 666. And look how it looks in Hebrew. 666, or va, va, va. I want to show you, there's the Pope. I'll see you in Philadelphia. That's the official release by the Vatican. And here is the picture. Six, six, six. You can see it on the robes of the cardinals. Six, six, six in the Hebrew. I mean, is it an accident? Well, here's the thing. Even if this picture was taken and it was not staged to happen this way, I mean, you have to understand, the Vatican doesn't just release photos either accidentally. This is the official photo announcing of the Pope Francis coming to America. This is the Vatican's official photo, and in the photo, it's plain. You can see the in Hebrew, 666, the Hebrew letters. There it is again. Dindire un jubileo straordinario che abbia al suo centro la misericordia di Dio. Sarà un anno santo della misericordia. When they say peace and security, then sudden destruction comes on them, like labor pains come on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. Be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. They will not escape. Pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen. There's many other verses where it says to watch. Um, what is it? Luke 21, 36. Uh, watch and pray that you be accounted worthy to escape these things which are coming upon the earth and stand before the Son of Man. 
Angelica Zambrano visited to heaven for 23 hours. At the time of coming back, she saw a vision of the rapture. Many Christians were left behind. We walked to a place with a giant screen, and I saw people in it. I could observe the whole world. Then suddenly I saw thousands of people disappearing. Pregnant women had their pregnancy disappear, and they looked like they had gone crazy screaming. Children had disappeared from all over. Many people were running from here to there, screaming, This can't be, this can't be. What's happening? Children should start receiving education through Jesus Christ and be faithful at an early age so that they will be lifted up in the sky when the trumpet blows. Vision 2 It was in the middle of downtown Los Angeles, California. Holy Spirit taught me that on Wilshire Boulevard, a young man and woman were walking in the sidewalk along the street. They were heading west with the man walking to the bush side and the woman walking to the street side. The man was making an impassioned speech to the woman, criticizing Jesus. Being lost in his rational criticism, he called the Bible irrational and made comments to ignore Christianity. The woman was walking carefully and praying inside without any response to his remarks, with her head down a little bit and a book held to her chest. Have mercy on him, Lord. In the middle of her prayer, she suddenly heard the loud trumpet sound from the sky. Rise up here. She looked up in the sky with her face full of joy and excitement. She had no time to express her joy because she was raised up in the air the moment she looked up. He suddenly found her gone and looked around in bewilderment to find her when there was a clash in the street. God granted me spiritual knowledge as if I were watching the scene and taught me that the trumpet sound are only heard by those who get raptured. There would not be many people who were ascending in the air in those circumstances which give some idea about how much spiritually corrupted cities are. I was looking down at the scene high up in the air and asked Jesus, What will the world say about people being raised up in the air, Jesus? He gave me accurate and detailed answers. NASA of the United States will make an announcement that thousands of UFO from a distant planet in the universe surrounded the entire Earth and abducted numerous people around the world. A building that looked like a county official building woke up to the emergency sirens ringing through the building. People were perplexed in this situation that Jesus mentioned before. That is, people were abducted, and those who were left behind were talking about it in surprise. A young single lady came out of the building in a hurry and arrived at her home. Going into the house, she yelled, Mom! She was looking around the house to find her mom suddenly stopping at a point to realize what happened. A devout Christian, her mom always reasoned with her who ignored her persuasion and regarded her stories about the end of the world as a joke. Then she had a realization. It was not an abduction case by aliens from a distant planet, but the rapture. Her mom was raised into heaven, and she was left in the world to face the tribulation. Realizing all of those, she plunked herself down and wept bitterly in such great pain. I turned my head and asked Jesus, Lord, talk about the statement the Pope made a while ago. Why did he make such a statement? My questions concerned the statement that only Roman Catholicism is the true church by Pope Benedict XVI. Regarding the issue, Jesus said in a resolute tone, It is one of Satan's strategies to establish a world government. Roman Catholicism is showing its true colors to advocate and help him before Antichrist appears. Calling Mary was a practice to serve Antichrist as an idol. Now they declared that only Roman Catholicism is the only church in order to muster strength and force to establish a world government. Lord, save the souls in Roman Catholicism. Jesus said, Didn't I tell you? I never lose a soul that belongs to me. It is your role to spread the book among them diligently. I will make claim to the souls of my people reading the text and save them. The Lord told me, Daughter, in those days, death will flee. In those days the Holy Spirit will no longer be on earth. There were accidents but I didn't see a single dead person, all of them were alive, although injured. After the rapture observed enormous traffic with thousands of people. He told me, Daughter, look, 
This is how everything will happen. I then saw people running from one place to another, shouting, Christ came, Christ came. They would plead, Lord, forgive me, forgive me, take me with you. But sadly the Lord said, It will be too late. The time to repent is now. Daughter, go tell humanity to seek me, for during that time there will no longer be opportunity. Daughter, it will be too late for all those that stay behind. When Jesus observed how people were left behind, he began to weep. On the screen I saw people running around. Magazines and TV news said that Christ had come. The screen closed, and Jesus finished by saying, I will go for the holy people. This was all he showed me. After that, he brought me back here to earth. With angels gathered round, we began to descend these beautiful stairs, white steps with flowers surrounding them. I was crying all the way down, pleading with Jesus, Lord, please, don't leave me here. Take me with you. He responded, Daughter, the nations, your family are waiting for you, you must enter that body. You must receive life, so you can go and testify what it you have seen. Many will not believe you, many will believe you, but I am your faithful witness. I am with you. I will never leave you. The Lord told me, Daughter, in those days the Holy Spirit will no longer be on earth. And I saw enormous traffic, with accidents. Many people wanted to kill themselves, but Jesus said, They shall seek death but death shall flee from humanity. Death will no longer be during that time. I saw people watching TV and magazines that read, thousands and thousands have disappeared. Many already knew that Christ had come for his holy people. Those who knew the Lord, but were left behind, went crying through the streets, wanting to kill themselves, but they could not do anything. While in heaven, Jesus said, I will come for a holy people and I will come soon for my church. But recently, the Lord told me, Daughter, I take pleasure in what you are doing, that you are fulfilling what I have given you, but do not tell my people that I am coming soon. Tell my people that I am coming right away. Again the Lord said, Tell my people that I am coming right away and that I am coming for the holy people. Tell my people that only the holy ones, only the holy ones will see me and do not be silent. Keep on declaring what I have told you. Visions of the Rapture The Testimony of an Eight-Year-Old Girl, Janet Baldur's Kamla, who encountered Jesus Christ. On September 5, 1999, I was in the church and I fell to the floor and felt the Lord's presence in me. And God began to show me visions. In one vision, I saw two roads, one was very wide, with many people walking to the destruction. The other road was very narrow, I saw there were many people walking down this road, praising and giving honor to the Lord's. I saw how the Lord was crying, because he feels pain when we let him down. Heaven. He said, Servant I will show you many things, I will show you the streets of gold in the crystal sea so you can go and tell my people the grandeurs that I have for them. We soon arrived to a place with beautiful streets, so beautiful. I have never seen such things on earth. The streets were shining. The Lord said, My servant, touch this street of gold, because you and my people will live here, because here my people will come very soon. After that we arrived at the Crystal Sea. It was so beautiful. While I was riding with the Lord through that precious sea he told me, My servant, all this is not mine, all this is for my people. All that you can touch I have prepared it with so much love for my people. Then he said, Servant come here, because I will show you other things. We then arrived in a beautiful place where I could see the glory of God, and feel his power. It was a big beautiful place. I saw many tables, so I asked the Lord, Lord what are all these tables for? He said, Servant, remember the wedding of the Lamb, remember that on these tables we will celebrate the wedding of the Lamb. I saw countless numbers of tables, and I could not see the end of them. 
The tables were very nicely decorated. I saw how each angel was putting on the fork, the knife, the spoon, the glasses, the dishes, all made of gold, so beautiful. The Lord told me, Servant, tell my people to get ready because very soon, I will take them with me so they can come here and enjoy with me in the wedding of the Lamb. Vision of the Rapture After that the Lord said, Servant I will show you the rapture, I will show you how my coming will be. Then we arrive at the throne of God, and I saw thousands and thousands of angels gathered together there. Then we started to go down, and the Lord and I stopped in a very white beautiful cloud. The Lord gave orders to the angels to come and receive the church, and the Lord told me, Servant watch carefully, because this is the way it will be when I come back this will be my coming. I saw people raised from the four corners of the earth, praising the name of the Lord. All those people were covered with the power of God. They were dressed in white robes. They began to sing a very beautiful song, Holy, Holy, Holy are you O Lord. Thank you Father. For you have raised us. Thank you Lord, for you have raised us. I saw many different people. Tall, short, dark, white. All the people, and all those angels went up to the cloud where the Lord and I were. All the people and angels were full of thanksgiving to the Lord. It was such a tremendous thing, I saw so many people that I thought I knew them. They all were covered with the glory of God. Vision of the Tribulation After that we arrived at the throne of God, and the Lord said, Servant, come here. We went out of the throne room and arrived at a place with a very tiny window. The Lord said, Servant, now look down. I saw terrible desolation, such tremendous desolation. The Lord said, Look servant, this is what is going to be after I have taken my people from the earth, this will be after my coming, this will be when my church is here with me. I saw people that were celebrating one moment, but then, I saw a father looking for his son, a mother looking for her daughters, but they couldn't find them, because Almighty God had taken them. Something terrible what was happening over there. I saw a pastor running from one place to another, and I asked the Lord, Lord, why does that man run from one place to another? The Lord replied, Servant. This man was a pastor, but because he thought that I was going to delay, he was left behind. He did not think that I was going to come now, he thought that it was going to take a long time before I would come back, and that is why he was left behind. The pastor was running all over, saying, Lord, why was I left behind? If I am a pastor, if I have a position in the church, and the church is gone, I am left behind. Why have I been left behind? The Lord said, Servant, I cannot do anything now, he thought my coming was going to delay, well, he was left behind. I saw how that man was persecuted. He said, The only thing I want is to be taken with Christ. The only thing that I want is to be with the Lord because I do not want to be here and suffer in the great tribulation. He kept running from place to place and asking himself, Why was I left behind? Take me with you Lord. I don't want to be here and suffer. The Lord said, Servant, there is nothing I can do now. For a long time I talked with him and told him that I was going to come very soon, but he didn't believe me, well, now he is left behind. So many people were running desperate trying to find peace but they could not find it. They were shouting, We want the word of life. We are thirsty of the word of God. But it was already too late, because the Lord had taken the church with him. I saw so many young people running through the bushes, running through the mountains trying to find peace. They wanted peace but they could not find it. The Lord told me, servant I have already taken my church, and now Satan is the one in control. Satan was already ruling over the earth and there was torment everywhere.
My research proves that it is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. The President of the United States is guilty. Guilty of giving aid and comfort to our deadliest enemies. To terrorists who have already killed thousands of us. He is giving deadly weapons to Al-Qaeda. Weapons systems designed to shoot airplanes out of the sky. Weapons that make no distinction between military and civilian airplanes. The Obama administration has shipped these state-of-the-art weapons directly to Al-Qaeda affiliates in Egypt, Libya, and Syria. In this video, I will present irrefutable proof. Needless to say, the administration has done everything it can to keep this story under wraps. It's stonewalling Congress, telling outright lies when cornered, Subjecting career CIA officials to regular lie detector tests to prevent leaks. And threatening any potential whistleblowers into silence. But now, despite the administration's best efforts, the truth has begun to emerge. People were running from place to place. People fight at each other. They blamed each other and hurt each other because they wanted to find peace, but they couldn't find it. I saw such horrifying things. People were saying, we want love. We want peace. But it was too late. The Lord told me, look my servant, I talked to them, I spent time knocking at the hearts of these people, but they did not want to look for me. Well, now they are left behind, and there is nothing I can do for them now. Why, because I have already taken my church with me. While all my people are with me in heaven enjoying the marriage of the Lamb, all these people will suffer great pain, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For they did not want to obey my word, they preferred to make fun and criticize my word. There's so many verses that say watch. Um, when Jesus came into Jerusalem, he rebuked those people and he said, you can discern the face of the sky, but how is it that you cannot discern the signs of the times? Uh, he actually expected them to know the time of their visitation, and they didn't know it. So he proclaimed the, um, the judgment by the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. I mean, he already knew all this was going to happen, but um, it's clear in Scripture that he expected them to know the time of their visitation. You can even go all the way back to Genesis, and God said that, um, I will not always strive with man, but man's ears will be 120 years. Now, people have taken that to think, okay, a man's lifespan can only be 120 years. But if you take 120 jubilees and do the math on that, um, a jubilee is 49 years, and then the 50th year is. Um, the Jubilee year. So, 50 times 120. That's 6,000 years. So, 120 Jubilees is exactly the 6,000 year time frame. And then we have the 1,000 year millennium. You know, and that matches the creation week because Peter said, uh, Peter said, a day shall be as a thousand years and a thousand years as a day to the Lord. So, you know, the creation week is a mirror of this, you know, 7,000 year human experience we're having. So there's so much going on here. Um, this, uh, this Prophecies of Daniel was written, I believe, in 1733 by Isaac Newton. Daniel 9.27 says that there's going to be seven weeks. So there'll be seven weeks from the time that Jerusalem is made the capital until the coming of the Son of Man. Okay? And I'll, I'll I'm just going to pull it up for you. Um, and, and you guys have probably read this scripture many, many times, but I do want to pull it up for you because this still gets into my main point. So Daniel, you go to look at the book of Daniel, and you go to chapter 9, which is really his key prophetic chapter. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, it's verse 25. Verse 25, so you are to know and discern, are to know, so it's an imperative, that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, which...
until Messiah the Prince, that's pretty clear to Jesus, there will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. It will be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. Okay? So, seven weeks. We, the 62 weeks have already passed, and you can look at a, a variety of reasons as to why that is, but the seven weeks would be 49 years, or, or almost that jubilee period. Well, 49 years from 67 is to now, it's to 2016. It's to 2016, so it points to this time frame. Again, I don't want to get into months and days because I don't think that's overly critical. We're in the season. We're in the season. And go read for yourself Daniel 9.25. Read Matthew 24, uh, 32 to 35, the fig leaf generation. 1947 to 2017, um, but I, I, I think this is very much the time. That's the first piece. So we're in the generation, and we're in the jubilee. We're in the 70-year generation, and we're in the, the final 49 weeks. Okay, so which gets me to my second point, which is the jubilees. There, uh, there is the Sabbath, the Shemitah, and the jubilee. The Sabbath is something that the Jews celebrated on the seventh day, the seventh day of rest from creation. The Shemitah, okay, or the Shemitah, however it's referenced, is the seventh year. Okay, it was a year of rest. Jonathan Kahn does a whole study on the seventh year. And I want to explain a Jubilee. A Jubilee is the 50th year. So per the book of Leviticus, the Israelites were supposed to allow people to come back to their own land and forgive them their debts on the 50th year. Interesting that we're covered up in debt, and this is the 50th year. Well, all the, the, the Sanhedrin rabbis all confirm that the year Hebrew year 5776, which is this year, is the Jubilee year. It ends October 2nd to October 12th, give or take. Again, don't worry about days. It ends October of this year started September of last year, ends October of this year, is the fifth is the is the 50th year, okay, once again, very interesting, 67, 1967, but it's the it's the 50th year. It is what some people would call the final jubilee, okay? From a thousand to the birth of Christ is 80 jubilees, okay? From the from the birth of Christ to 1000 AD is 100 jubilees, okay, from 1000 AD to 2000 AD is 20 more jubilees. We're, we're in the 120th jubilee, just at, a, just at a big overarching look at the period of time. We're in the time of rest. We're in the, Watchman for That Great Day has a great video on this. We're in the seventh day and if a day is a thousand years, we're in the, after 2000 AD, if the earth is 6,000 years old, we're in the seventh day of rest, okay? And people will beat you up until the end of time that the earth is, you know, eight billion years old or whatever, whatever. I don't, we can't, how can we even affirm that carbon dating is correct? But I want I'm not going to get into all that. We're in the seventh day of rest. We're in the 120th Jubilee. So 120, do your gazentas. 120 times 5, or times 50, excuse me, times 50, as you might imagine, is 6,000, 6,000 years, 4,000 to 2,000 A.D. We're in the 120th Jubilee, almost any way you slice it, right now, okay, right now. Then you say, well, why do you care about 120? This is kind of my second prophetic point. Well, Genesis says in chapter 6, Verse 3, then the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, because he also is flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. That's often referred to by many scholars as 120 jubilees. This is the 120th jubilee. It also lines up with a rabbi, Rabbi Judah ben Samuel, who talks about the final ten jubilees, the final ten jubilees from 1517 to 2017, okay, amazing. Um, Google Rabbi Judah ben Samuel, I don't have time to get into it here, but he talks about the jubilees from 
really almost from 1100 until 2017. It ends in this 2016-2017 period. And the, a lot of people say, well, how do we know he was prophetic? Well, everything he lists in his prophecy has come true. Deuteronomy's measures of a prophet is that. They have to be 100% accurate. We're in the time. We're in the 120th Jubilee, which ends 2016-2017. We're in the final generation, which ends 2016-2017. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying, peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly, as labor pains on a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you, brothers and sisters, are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. Very truly, I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her baby is born, she forgets the anguish because of her joy that a child is born into the world. So with you, now is your time of grief. But I will see you again, and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. Very truly, I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. As a pregnant woman about to give birth writhes and cries out in her pain, so were we in your presence, Lord. We were with child. We writhed in labor. But we gave birth to wind. We have not brought salvation to the earth, and the people of the world have not come to life. But your dead will live, Lord. Their bodies will rise. Let those who dwell in the dust wake up and shout for joy. Your dew is like the dew of the morning. The earth will give birth to her dead. Go, my people. Enter your rooms and shut the doors behind you. Hide yourselves for a little while, until his wrath has passed by. See, the Lord is coming out of his dwelling to punish the people of the earth for their sins. The earth will disclose the blood shed on it. The earth will conceal its slain no longer. Hear that uproar from the city. Hear that noise from the temple. It is the sound of the Lord repaying his enemies all they deserve. Before she goes into labor, she gives birth. Do I bring to the moment of birth and not give delivery, says the Lord? Do I close up the womb when I bring to delivery, says your God? When you see this, your heart will rejoice and you will flourish like grass. The hand of the Lord will be made known to his servants, but his fury will be shown to his foes. Terror will seize them. Pain and anguish will grip them. They will writhe like a woman in labor. Welcome to Secrets of the Elite. I am Lindsay Williams, your host. I have waited for 35 years to make this DVD presentation. The people who have been friends to me over the years and have given me information, whom I refer to as the elite, are now retired in their 70s and 80s. I have withheld this information for these years out of respect for these people who have been willing to risk oftentimes uh, their position or their retirement in order to be able to tell me things. Let me say, if I may, emphatically, there positively is a group of people on the face of the earth who control the world. Nothing ever happens in Washington by chance. Nothing takes place in the financial world by happen so. Men behind closed doors have decided everything that's going to happen, and my lifestyle and yours oftentimes is controlled by these people, by what they do. These elite of the world know what's going to happen tomorrow morning. There's no question in their minds. Well, let me begin back where it began with me. I had been the pastor of a church for 12 years. I went to Alaska. And after arriving there, I found they were building the Trans-Alaska Oil Pipeline. I said, Chaplain, you're saving us thousands of dollars of counseling fees. We aren't having to pay. Your religious denomination is paying your salary. We would like to offer you executive status. And I said, well, what does that mean? He said, go any place you'd like, see anything you'd like to see. And when you happen to be at Prudhoe Bay, 
on the weekends, you're welcome to stay at Arco Base if you wish in executive dorms. And he said, we would like to invite you to sit in our board meetings in an advisory capacity in order to help the relationship between management and labor. I had not the slightest idea what I was getting into. For three years time, I sat with, lived in the same dorms with, was across the dinner table from, rode in the vehicles with, and day after day were in the presence of people that the average person never gets to meet. People who control the world, they literally do. Uh, if someone had asked me before I went to the Trans-Alaska Oil Pipeline, Chaplain, do you believe there's a group of people on the face of the earth who control the world? I would have laughed at them. And I would have said, who are you, a John Bircher? If someone had asked me that question three years later, after I had lived with these people, do you believe there's a group of people who tell the president what to do, dictate to Congress what bills to pass, tell OPEC on any given day what they're going to give them for a barrel of oil, I would have said, not only do I believe it, I sat and listened to them talk about it. So now you can understand why I can so emphatically make the statement, there positively is a group of people on the face of the earth who control the world. I remember one morning, I walked into Arco Base, and Mr. Ken Fromm was sitting there. And he greeted me and said, Chaplain, come on over. I'd like to introduce you to someone. And said, he's the International Secretary Treasurer of Exxon Corporation. I tried my best over those three years time to try to comprehend these people, their mindset. Now, keep in mind, I had been a pastor for all those years, had had many opportunities of counseling with every type of a situation imaginable had graduated with a bachelor's degree, so I had some idea of how to work with people from my schooling years. And now I had the opportunity to understand people that the average person never comes in contact with. Um, I tried to figure out how they think, what their lifestyles are. And I honestly believe, as I look back over those years now, that the reason I was there was the providence of God. Uh, th there is no way that a little insignificant unknown missionary flying airplanes out in the bush of Alaska could have ever lived with the elite for three years time except by the providence of God. And there is no way that I could possibly be here today on this DVD trying to explain to you the things that you need to know in order to be able to overcome the new world order except by the providence of God. I think you're viewing this DVD by God's providence. And the things that I say I hope will be a great help to you in your life so that you can keep food on your dinner table, can overcome the elite and the new world order, and you can if you understand their mindset, but only if you understand the thought patterns, the mindset of these people. I have written numerous books. In fact, I've written six books. My first book was The Energy Nine Crisis, and I wrote it for the purpose of helping you understand how these people think and, and how they live uh, and what, how to comprehend them. There was a second book entitled To Seduce a Nation. And all of these books are written for the purpose of helping you understand the elite of the world. Within a year or so, it became a bestseller. People were hungry for the truth. They wanted to know what really is going on out there. And the book told them. At that point, uh, I began getting invitations from speaking engagements all across the country, I mean, day after day. And finally, the mission board that I happened to be with at the time said, Chaplain, you can't publish a secular book and, and still be a missionary in Alaska. I said, no problem, I'll gladly resign. <laughs> after all, there was a whole world out there to tell about what was going on and to tell about Jesus Christ. So I chose that, uh, left Alaska and began traveling. I have spoken in every state in America with the exception of Maine, had the opportunity to travel to Australia, New Zealand, many countries of the world. 
People are hungry for the truth. And for a person who lived that story, what you're hearing today is what I lived. I was there. I saw them. I heard them. I ate across the dinner table from them. I lived in the dorms with them. The elitists are not survivalists. Now you say, but chaplain, if the elite know what's going to happen, they understand what tomorrow is going to bring, and it could be catastrophic events, then why haven't they made preparations for survival? Oh, <laughs> you see, since they know what's going to happen tomorrow, they know tomorrow how to do what's necessary to do where if you wait until after the currency has already collapsed or you wait until after some, uh, someone has bombed a few more uh, like they did in, or I should have say, run, flown airplanes as they did in 9-11. You see, you wait until after the fact because you don't know in advance what's going to happen. The elite know ahead of town exactly what's going to take place and Therefore, they don't have to do what you and I have to do in the way of making preparations for these things. Have you ever wondered why so many of the elitists, and I'll name two at this point, by the way. Uh, have you ever wondered why they live to a ripe old age? Uh, one of the elite of the elite would be George Herbert Bush, Daddy Bush. Uh, and another one, if I could name them, would be Mr. Henry Kissinger. They're in their 80s, still healthy. Why do these men live to be such, uh, at such an age? They know some things you don't know. But some things I'm going to tell you today, you will need to view all of these DVDs because some things may be more important to you toward the end. Pastor David Bowen. Uh, he was a Hollywood playwright at one time. Mark Johnson, he's going to deal with a subject that I have never heard a definition of that I was satisfied with. You must hear about derivatives. Uh, derivatives could, at any point that they wish to pull the plug, bring the entire financial system, both Europe, America, the, the Middle East, I, I, I care not what part of the world it is, the Orient, it could bring the entire world to a collapse tomorrow morning if and when they're ready for it to. Maybe some have never even heard of the derivatives, but you're going to hear them now. There were some people who were watching me, and I didn't know they were there. You never know who's in your audiences. They said, we have teaching seminars on the lifestyle and the methods of the elite. Well, I said, that's interesting. I lived with them for three years, and I have the personal phone numbers of a few of them. I wonder if what you're seeing, or what you are saying, and what I saw are the same. They said, well, here's what we'd like to do. We, whenever you find people in your seminars that you think might be interested in being trained in the secrets of the elite, uh, would you be willing to introduce them to us? I said, well, first of all, I have to find out what you're teaching. So they said, okay, uh, we will buy your airline ticket. We'll pay all of your expenses to our resort in the Bahamas, and we'd like you to come out and see. I was amazed. I did. I took them up on their offer. I've never been afraid to go places and meet people. And so I did. Beautiful. Private beach. Oh, you, you've never seen such facilities, such food. And I stayed there for a week, and I heard some of the most renowned speakers that you could possibly imagine explaining the insides, the, the inner workings of the social elite. As many of you know, one of my elitist friends passed away a year ago. Some of you have heard me give his name on radio shows. And before he died, he basically said to me, he said, Chaplain, I'm too old to care. Just go ahead and tell the world everything. Well, at that point, I decided I would. And I have told some things. But there are many things I have never told until today that you've never heard until this DVD series. 
And the things that I saw these people teaching in these seminars at this fabulously beautiful resort in the Bahamas was exactly what I had heard the elite talking about. You see, they make the laws. There's not a single bill that goes before Congress that is not written by the elite. They know what the bill's going to be before it ever gets there. The congressmen don't. Very seldom does a congressman ever read an entire bill. Practically never does a president of the United States of America ever read a bill that goes before Congress. And he signs it. And the congressmen sign it. Who wrote it? I know who wrote it. I heard them talking about these things. The secrets of the elite are known by every congressman. The secrets of the elite are known by federal judges. The secrets of the elite are known by a few lawyers. But you don't know them. They don't want you to know them. They train their young elites as to their thought patterns and their mindset and how they should do things. And as soon as a person arrives in Washington in Congress, I'm going to tell you some of the things they're taught. And you're going to find some very surprising things in the course of all of this. Every president of the United States of America is briefed on these things. And very soon they realize where they stand. I, I'll give you a statement. You can find this one on the internet for yourself. This statement was made by Lloyd Blankenfein. He is the boss at Goldman Sachs. And this uh, was made, the statement was made to the Sunday Times of London, England. And he said, bankers do God's work. <laughs> Did you catch that? This man said to the London Times, Sunday Times, bankers do God's work. These people think that they have a right to do what they're doing. They are fully convinced that you and I are dumb, stupid, don't understand what they're doing, and most people don't. And that's one of the reasons I'm producing this DVD series, because I don't want you to be ignorant of what the elite are doing. I want you to be knowledgeable of what's happening. And the only way that you will overcome the new world order is to be knowledgeable as to how they carry on everything that they do. Before AT&T was ever declared a monopoly, they knew it, knew what was going to happen. And why did they do it? Because when AT&T was declared a monopoly, that meant that other companies, Sprint, uh, Horizon, all these companies would spring up in their place. And how does a new company start? They borrow money from the elite. So they wanted AT&T declared a monopoly. So the elite could turn around and lend money to all of these new companies that would get going because AT&T didn't need them anymore. This is just an idea of how the elite bring about their control factor. 1983, I heard when I was at the meetings in the Bahamas, I heard them talking about something that you didn't hear until just the last year or two. Free trade outsourcing. Those seminars in the Bahamas that I was attending, already back in those days, they were training the young elite to take the industry from America to China and India and Mexico moving it out of this country, taking away your jobs. And already in those days, I was hearing them talking about free trade, outsourcing, before you ever knew, oh, I hope this will anger you to no end. The elite knew that they had to take their industry abroad. Why? Well, you just heard from the Wall Street Insider. You, you're going to hear about other uh, facets of how Congress makes money, it all boils down to this. Let's move our factory to China. Now, we'll make our fortune there in China. Then what do we do with that? If we bring it back into America, it falls under the rules of, well, you know the story. So they don't do it. Where do they take that? 
this was one of the things that was so fascinating in these seminars that I attended. Where do the elite take their money? Well, they moved industry abroad intentionally. You, you can see why the, the government officials and others fall for the things that the elite are telling them. The Federal Reserve was produced for the, for the sake of the elite. The World Bank and the IMF manage money according to the way that the elite want them to. You heard me correctly. They are taught how to enslave the masses. Let me try to explain. I learned many things about the elite. And one of the first things I learned was to listen to their buzzwords. Probably the next most important thing, and by the way, let me pause here long enough to say, any movie that comes out of Hollywood, uh, any uh, uh, liberal news media, any program that I might watch on any given afternoon, I can pick out buzzwords. I have tuned my mind and my ear over 35 years uh, to listening to what these people have to say. And things that the average person would probably never pick up on, immediately they stand out in my mind. The elite, the second thing I learned, most important thing about the elite, they have a code of ethics. <laughs> now I know this sounds strange, and especially when it's coming from a man who's been a minister of the gospel for 55 years. But the elite do have a code of ethics. Now, their code of ethics is quite different than your code of ethics and my code of ethics. My code of ethics is the Word of God, the Bible. My Savior is Jesus Christ. And everything that I do in life revolves around obedience to the Word of God, if at all possible. But the elite have a code of ethics also. Their code of ethics, one of the facets of their code of ethics is they must tell you everything they're going to do before they do it. You heard me correctly. They will tell you through a Hollywood movie. They will tell you through buzzwords. They will tell you through expressions that you may hear on the national media. And as you know, Hollywood is their perversion, and the national liberal media is their mouthpiece. You've probably heard me say that on radio shows. But if you know how to tune your ear to listen to what the elite are saying, you will know everything that's going to take place tomorrow, a week from now, a month from now, a year from now. If you know how to listen to what they're telling you. You're going to be total slave two years from now. Two years from now, you won't have any money left. But for right now, I'll just give you your baseball and apple pie and let you have a good time out here with your beer and watching your television set. And you never mind raising up against the elite. Just go ahead and let them do what they want to. What difference does it make? After all, you're okay right now. So you see, the elite do have a God. They do have a set of morals. They do worship. And who did George Bush talk about? God bless America. Uh, what God? Now, the elite have a code of ethics. Their code is not the Bible. But they do have a code of ethics. One of the codes of, I'm going to go over these things point by point now because th this is going to amaze many people out there in the viewing audience. One of the codes of ethics that I learned from the elite is they are obligated by their code of ethics to tell you everything they're going to do before they do it. Hmm. Now, I didn't say that they'll stand up before the television and say, this is what I'm going to do to you two years from now. They do it in buzzwords. Uh, think for a moment. A movie. I mentioned this in the uh, number two DVD on yesterday, but I, I'll repeat it here slightly. The movie Oil Storm came, it was all over television two weeks before Katrina. And it pictured everything that Katrina was going to do to New Orleans. 
And everybody said, marvelous movie, well produced, quite well done. Katrina hit, did everything it said, and I never heard any more about it. People never even put the two together. But the elite, through their buzzwords, through the movie that they had had Hollywood to produce, were telling you everything that they were going to do by harp and the other programs that they have to manipulate a hurricane where they wanted it to go, and they were telling you everything that they were going to do, but the average American never paid any attention, did not catch it. So I'd like to try to point out what I want you to look for. Now, here's the buzzwords of the elite. Uh, I want you to watch for the war movies that come out, and they'll start shortly. More than likely, you'll see all of this over a period of time because they're obligated by their moral code to tell you what they're going to do. Number two, uh, the national media is their mouthpiece. And you will hear from some of the leading people in the media buzzwords whereby they will tell you everything they're going to do some while back. I very seldom watch television. I know that the media, everything they say, you believe the exact opposite, and that's what the truth is. So I very seldom ever watch the evening news. But one night, I was sitting there watching the evening news, and I was appalled what I saw. Here was this famous newscaster, and he was interviewing, of all people, Bush Sr., who was president of the United States of America many years ago, old, old man now, and he was in a, this newscaster was interviewing him, and they went through the whole process. Bush answered his questions kind of curtly like he used to do, and finally it came down to the end, and he asked him one final question. He said, Mr. Bush, I'd like to ask you one last question, and, and he said, this kind of relates to this newscast. He said, do you watch the evening news? <laughs> I mean, that, that was a rather pointed question. But the old man, Bush, spoke up with no hesitation whatsoever and said no. <laughs> Just like that. Well, it, the, the newscaster was really taken back. I mean, he hesitated for a moment. He had a terrible time finding his words. And he finally said, well, Mr. Bush, why not? Oh, his words were the greatest buzz words I think I've ever heard out of the elite because Mr. Bush said, I already know what it's going to be. Just like I heard it with my own ears. If I had not heard it, I would not have believed it if someone had told me. He said, because I already know what it's going to be because he is one of the elite of the elite. He and Kissinger and a few others, and they know everything that's going to happen. You listen to the media. The media over the next two years are going to be giving you some choice buzzwords if you know how to interpret what they're saying. Next, Hollywood is their perversion. Now, do you, are you noticing my words here? I got these six o'clock this morning. Now, very unusual. The national media is a mouthpiece. Hollywood is their perversion. Mm -hmm. They had to take away the value. And they had to give you a piece of paper in exchange. A piece of paper? What good's that paper? It, it doesn't even have redeemable anymore by silver and gold. Now it's no more than a Federal Reserve note. And what is the Federal Reserve? It's not even an agency of the government of the United States of America. It is a private corporation that has literally taken over our currency in this country. The elite have taken away your God. Yes, you heard me correctly. They had to. You've heard me tell this before on radio shows and in other DVD presentations I've made, but they have a plan to remove the God who made America great. And the only way that they could bring in their new world order was to remove the God that had made America great from our society. They took the Ten Commandments off of the courthouse steps. They removed the Bible from the classroom. They had to remove righteousness and God from our society before they could bring in their new world order. You see, all of this was taught. The younger elite are taught one thing. How to enslave you. Now, I'm going to coin a word here. The name of the game is control. Prepare to meet thy God, humanity. 
prepare to meet the God of the Bible. And what does the Bible say? Now, this is not Lindsay Williams talking. I'm going to quote, and I will give you where the chapter and verse is. I'm going to quote from God's holy word, the Bible. The creator of all heaven and earth, Yahweh, in the Hebrew language. I'm going to quote his word, which has always been right. George Washington depended on it. All of our founding fathers depended on it. They went to it for the writing of the Constitution.